Hi, everyone. Uh, name is Alexander Pittendry. You can call me Alex. It's much better. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about Webpack. So we've been using Webpack. My team has been using Webpack for six months, approximately, to bundle production Webpack applications. Um, and my hope is to teach the people that have used Webpack already something, but also to introduce people who haven't used it to a wonderful development tool. <coughs> so Webpack is quite popular. It's got close to 30,000 likes or stars on GitHub. It is downloaded 267,000 times a day, and these stats were taken last weekend, so th they might be even better now. Um, so if you're someone who is concerned about using open source technologies, don't worry about using this one. It's got a fantastic community. The most recent update was released last month on the 19th of June, and the primary thing that they were focusing on for that update was speed. So they're listening to the community and they're focusing on things that improve the quality of their product. Cool. So the concept with something about bundling. So Webpack at the core is a bundler, and back in the bad old days, when we first started developing web applications, we would include our dependencies one by one in our index.html. And every time our browser encountered a dependency, it would make a request to the server. And if you're using HTTP 1 or 1.1 or anything under 2, every request to the server is prefaced with a handshaking operation, which consumes time and ultimately affects the performance of your site. So someone came up with this idea of bundling stuff so you take all your dependencies, you put them into one file, and your website loads faster. Awesome. So <clears throat> at some point, the bundle started getting too big. And now we have this performance issue once again. So to install Webpack, you need a NPM project with a package to JSON. And you just do an NPM install Webpack and a dash uh, save or save dev to keep it in your package to JSON so it can be restored when your project is moved to another developer's PC. If you want to install a specific version, you give it an at, and you give it the version number. Or if you want the latest version, you just say at latest. If you want to install it globally, add a dash g. So one of the things that make Webpack difficult to understand, but also make it very powerful, is the way that it analyzes your application. It follows your common JS imports, your AMD imports, and your Harmony imports, and it builds up a dependency graph of your application. And it considers everything to be a module, which is key to what makes it good, because it allows for code reuse. And it allows those modules to work independently of other modules, so you don't have side effects from your other dependencies, unless you want them to be there. Then it takes this list of dependencies, runs it through Webpack, and it uses a thing called the webpack.config, which tells it how to handle those dependencies and how to bundle your application. And you get on the other side some static assets which you can put into your uh, website. Cool. So as I just mentioned, the webpack.config is the thing that tells Webpack how to bundle your application, how to read it, and how to make it usable for your user at the end of the day. It is also the single most confusing thing about Webpack. <coughs> so let's look at a basic uh, no, not a basic, an advanced webpack.config, which you would typically get when you install um, something like create React app, or if you're using Angular CLI, or if you're using uh, React Starter Kit. So you get these very advanced um, webpack.configs, and you typically end up here when something has gone wrong, like me. You wanted to import a font into your application. You didn't understand the webpack.config. You're a programmer, you don't read the documentation, and you spend two days trying to get fonts into your application. Very embarrassing and not ideal. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to basics. This is a very rudimentary webpack.config, and you can use this to bundle your JavaScript dependencies. Um, you put it into a file, you tell it module.exports this object, and this thing over here, the entry, is how you tell Webpack where to start building that dependency graph. So start here, follow my application down until it ends, and then in the output key, you can tell it what to call your bundle, file name.js and bundle name. 
So I want to start with one of the coolest features that Webpack gives you, and this is the fact that you can use other tools to use ES6 uh, or ES 2015 in your browser. Um, I have a little website here that right now doesn't do very much at all. It's got two input fields, and I have the code here in the background. So index.js. Um, and this is where my application starts. This is the root. This is my entry for my webpack.config. And you can see here that I'm using two different kinds of imports. I'm using the Harmony import from ES6, and I'm using uh, CommonJS imports just require. And then in this form actions file, I've got another dependency, validators, which I'm also importing from somewhere else. So I've got this basic webpack.config again that I showed you in that example. And if I go to my package.json, I've got some scripts that I'm using to bundle my application. So I'm telling Webpack, well, for build, I want to use Webpack, give it the flag config, and use my config, webpack.config. Really simple. So I go to my console, and I tell him, can run, build. Cool. So now we go back here, and I've got a button. Great success. And when I click the button, it will say clicked. <laughs> so let's look at this bundle quickly. Um, Webpack has put a bunch of garbage in here that facilitates loading. Uh, it's not ideal, but it's doing this because it wraps each import uh, in a function to facilitate loading on demand. So you're only bringing these dependencies into memory when you need them. Uh, another thing you'll notice is that the dependencies are here in my file in the same order that they were in my application. So the button.js dependency is first at zero, sorry, like all arrays are. And then I've got the <coughs> second dependency, and I've got the last dependency that I imported. So everything is there in the same order that it was in my application. And uh, despite that I, the fact that I used different kinds of inputs, everything worked. So that's really great, and it makes dev much easier. And this is one of the reasons why I like Webpack, why I love Webpack, and why I would recommend it for other people to use too. Cool. So let's check out quickly. Now we want to use some ES6. No, stop it. If we go back into the first dependency we had, uh, sorry, the second one, table store. Table. I'm using in here, um, that's not this one. I'm using in here the Lambda functions, which were in some of the other talks today. And this will work in any browser, despite the fact that it's not supported in most of them. And this is because I'm using something that Webpack calls a loader. So if I go back to my webpack.config, um, which is much more busy now, we'll see I've got this array rules. And this is where the confusion begins with the config, but it doesn't have to be confusing. How it works is each rule has a test key. And the thing after that is a regex. So it basically enumerates through all my dependencies, runs the file name against this regex, and if it matches, it pipes the, the, the source of that file through the loader and does whatever the loader tells it to do. And then at the end, it con concatenates all the stuff together and builds a bundle. So this is very similar to Gulp. And many of you will be familiar with this process. Um, and why, why I prefer this over Gulp is simply because it's easier to use. I don't have to explicitly tell Gulp to pipe the output from one task to the next task to the next task and go along. And it's easier to debug, and everything just works this way out of the box. Whew. So one cool thing, one important thing to note about these loaders is that they work from right to left. It's like contrary to everything else. You would expect that it would work from left to right but it doesn't, and it's confusing. 
So for example, if I swap this CSS loader and style loader around, my bundle would break, it wouldn't work anymore, and that's because it uses the CSS loader first, and the style loader takes the output from the CSS loader and injects the styles into my head of my um, website. <laughs> So I've written a little loader, and it doesn't do much other than output the um, output from the previous loader to the console. So the previous loader here is the Babel loader, which does the transpilation step. So if I run now, I'll see lots of JavaScript on my console, but I won't see any ES6 code. Cool, so there's a lot of JavaScript there. And over here, where I have var logo, I had some string interpolation, which has now been replaced with just plain old JavaScript. Um, and this really demonstrates how it's piping the output from one thing to the next. <sighs> okay, so Webpack does something other than bundle um, JavaScript. I can also work with styles and over here. Um, so just because I can do something, it's not a good reason to do something. So the style loader and CSS loader also facilitate some other stuff. So if I go to table.js and I look at the top of the file, I'll find that I've imported global styles, and then I've used styles again down here to reference a class in my CSS, uh, which is down here. <coughs> so something that I've done here is I've put this local stuff over here. So this tells Webpack to ref to give this class another name. So if I go back to my um, website and I reload and I inspect this, and you'll see that it's got some garbage here, and Webpack has just given me like some base64 string that it's used to give this class a unique name. So if I have multiple style sheets that I'm importing all over the place, the classes aren't going to clash with each other, and I'll be sure that I don't have side effects from accidentally redeclaring something. And that's super useful, and it's one of the reasons you might want to use um, Webpack for working with your styles. Cool. So um, one of the really great tools that Webpack comes with is the Webpack dev server. Um, and we all know it's kind of not nice. You make changes to your code, and then you have to rebuild manually, and then you have to refresh your page, and then only you see what you've done. And it's a very slow feedback loop, and it really impedes development. So at the bottom of this webpack.config, I've got another property called dev server. And I'm using dev server to do something called hot module Reloading. So this is different to the replacement stuff that Gulp does, because instead of reloading my whole page after replacing the bundle, I'm replacing only the module that has changed. So if you're using something like Angular or React, and you've got state in your application, the new bundle being injected will not change the state of your application. It will just work, and the changes you made will be there. So I can. NPM run, start again, and I'm just uh, calling another script in my package to JSON, and I'm starting up a little dev server, and when it's done bundling, it'll hopefully open a website. Oh, here it is already. <laughs> cool. So you can see the text here. I'm, I'm showing some errors in my server, but I've also got a button, and I want to make a change to that button, and I want to show you that before I can even alt tab back, that thing will have been replaced, and the code changes I made will be immediately visible to me, and I can determine if it's working or not. Switch back, and it's immediately changed. So that's really cool and really powerful. Um, but the, the fact that I'm using this dev server and the fact that I'm transpiling means that my code becomes less debuggable because after it's been mangled and transpiled, I just get this garbage. I mean, we can see here, it's a huge file. Let's 
with 1,500 lines for an application that doesn't do very much yet. So another cool thing that I can do to aid debugging is add source maps to my application. So I can then, in my browser, use breakpoints and debug the same code that I write in my IDE. So this is facilitated by something called the dev tool. And all I have to do to enable this is tell Webpack that I'm using GPFL source maps. And now, when I build in dev mode um, and I refresh, I will get some other sources here in the source tree. And if I explore this, I can find my button. And I can put a breakpoint there. And if I click on this button, I will hit that breakpoint. And that's really cool, and it's really powerful. So before I discovered this, I was debugging my React applications with console.log. And that's just not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> so hopefully, I've taught someone else how to avoid doing that. So the next problem we have is that we've got all this extra stuff in our bundle. And we don't really want that in our production build. <clears throat> so if we go back to our webpack.config, we are now exporting a function instead of an object. And this function mean the fact that we're using a function means that we can hook onto some other stuff that Webpack enables, and I can pass variables to my Webpack during the build process, and I can do different things depending on the environment that I want to build for. So if I go back to my package.json, I've added another script called build release, uh, and it's using exactly the same config but there's an extra parameter here, environment.release. <coughs> so I just want to go back and remove the loader that just console logs, because it's noisy. Stop this. So now while it's building, no. Oh, spelling mistake. <laughs> so now it's saying, OK, it's building in release mode. And I've, I've outputted the, the value there just to show like this is working the way I said it was. I'm not lying to you guys. <laughs> cool. Now, if we go back and look at our bundle um, and refresh our page, oh, sorry, it's still the server, which is dead, then the bundle is significantly smaller. It's gone from 1,500 lines to 700. Um, and I, I can do more to decrease this, but I'm using, I've explicitly left some stuff in to show you guys some stuff later. Cool. So, next. Yeah. One of the most powerful tools that um, Webpack enables is tree shaking. And tree shaking is the process of removing unused imports from your application. So if I export some stuff that I'm not using, it would generally be included in my bundle. And that's not ideal. It increases the size of my bundle, which ultimately increases the size of what I request on my server, which decreases the performance of my site. Not great. There are some caveats. This only works with ES6 modules. You have to be using Webpack 2 or greater. Uh, and you have to tell Babel via the Babel RC or some of the options in your loader not to transpile the Harmony imports. So I'll show you how to do that now. It's quite simple. Just tell it, don't transpile the modules. Easy. Then, if I go back to my webpack.config, um, I'm not using default webpack functionality. I'm using something called a plugin. And plugins run after all your loaders have completed and they further transform your bundle. So the, the plugin in particular that enables tree shaking is called Uglify.js. Some of you might be familiar with this. You can use it to mangle your code. You can use it to minify. You can use it to Uglify. And uh, do a bunch of other stuff. So let's go back to our website quickly and look at the validates file. So I'm exporting two functions here. I'm exporting validate email, and I'm exporting validate name. And I have intentionally not used validate name. Damn it. So if I search everywhere for that, the only place that I find it is 
in a comment in the bundle and in the export thing. So if I don't do another npm, oh, we've done that. So if I go, if I build for dev again, sorry, and I search for that function now, you'll see it's in the bundle. And uh, Webpack is putting a comment there, and it's telling me that it's unused. And then if I build for release, as I just showed you, then the only thing that stays behind is the comment. So that code is gone. Um, and it, that's really useful for decreasing the size of your bundles. So Uglify.js has other uses. If I go into my index.js again, at the bottom of this file, I have got something called underscore underscore is debug. And this is the variable that I haven't declared anywhere. Um, and if I go back to my webpack.config, there's another plugin called the define plugin. And this allows me to define global variables that get replaced at runtime. So if I look, for example, for this guy, I'm using it as the base URL for Axios when I fetch that mailing list. And I'm controlling what this variable is in my webpack.config by hooking into my isRelease flag. So if I'm building for release, I use localhost 81. If I'm not building for release, then I use localhost 8081. So if we go back to the site again, and if you recall from last time, there were some undefines in this table. They're gone now. And the other thing that's gone is this variable from my code. So it's in the code, but it's um, okay, let me just do this. Oh yeah, I'm not seeing because it's gone. <laughs> it's in the code, but it's not in the bundle. And that's because in the bundle it's been replaced during the build process. So if I search for localhost eighty one, the only place I should find it is in the webpack.config and in the bundle. So there and there again. So that's really cool. It's injected that stuff into my code. And this is great because if you're, for example, testing against one API for staging and another for uh, release, then without any extra work, I can change the environmental variables of my application in, during the build process. <clears throat> so switching back to dead code elimination, I had this guy over here, underscore, underscore, is debug which console.logs loaded if this value is true. So because we're building in release, is debug is false. So if I search for this guy everywhere, I won't find it in my bundle because it's gone. So <coughs> the other junk here, like module.hot, is also gone. And this is the stuff that the Webpack dev server uses to facilitate the hot module reloading. And it's not something that I want in my production build either. So you can also use this for feature flag switching. So if you have a feature that's partially complete, you can remove it from your build at build time. So in closing, um, Webpack is moving very, very quickly, and it has a large community. You'll end up in that webpack.config, and you'll be trying to diagnose a problem, and there'll be a suggestion on Stack Overflow, and then you go and put it into your webpack.config, and it doesn't work. And this is a really common complaint. And it's happened to me as well. Um, and what I've found is that it's just better to go to the Webpack site and follow their guides. Because as the community makes changes to the module, they also make changes to the documentation. So it's, in this rare case, the best place to go look for help. After that, it's GitHub and lastly, Stack Overflow. Thanks. <laughs> I've got seven minutes, for six minutes for questions, so ask away. I don't want that stuff in production. Like, it's only there to f facilitate reloading of modules when I'm developing, like, right then and there. So I don't need that functionality in production because I'm not, like, making changes and I don't want to see them immediately in my prod build. Does that make sense? Well, just like so I think I perhaps explain it badly, but I know, how to, I know how to solve your problem. 
So you can create chunks with Webpack, and the individual chunks can be used to create separate bundles. And you can also add extra variables into your webpack.config that you can use to version your bundles. So if you want to update just that dependency, you rebuild, you deploy, then when your client gets onto your site, they know what old version of all the bundles that you had. And because that specific dependency that you want to change has a different version number, it will only reload that bundle. Um, that Webpack dev server is actually an express server, and, you, and it's done by using a middleware for express called hot module reloading. <laughs> um, so you could theoretically do it if you were running an express server on your production environment with uh, hot module reloading enabled. And if you just like um, FTP onto your site and replace that file, it could probably like detect the change and inject it immediately. So what the React Static Kit does is it, it, so remember, it's just an object, right? So what the React Static Kit does is there's some common stuff if you're building for release or for production, I mean for dev or production, and they take the common stuff and they put it into an object and they put that into a separate file. And then they, when they build for the different environments, they require that file and then they do like an object.assign, and they take the two pieces and they bring them together, like the jQuery.apply, I think it's called. And then that, that way, the common code is in one small manageable piece, and all your other stuff, that your different uh, changes for prod or dev are in another file, and you can just combine them and work with small pieces at a time, like jQuery. So there's this thing called an external, and I don't have it in my, in my uh, config, but you can tell Webpack about externals, and you can say external jQuery. And then it will bundle that separately, but make it available for your bundle as well. So like, I don't know exactly how to tell you to solve it, but go to the documentation and look up externals. I'm pretty sure, like 99% sure, that that's going to solve your problem for you. Yeah. That's, that's how I would solve it. I haven't actually had problems with the consistency of the bundles. so. You can, my, you can speak to me afterwards, and maybe we can hook up on Slack, and I can help you out. Thank you.